Hello, I'm Laura Cassidy from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from the American Chemical Society Spring 2019 National Meeting in Orlando. We're joined today by Dr. Gabriel Lobo, or Gabriel Lobo of the University of California, Berkeley. He's studying how to make lead pipe safe. Mr. Lobo? Thanks, Laura, for the introduction and also for the opportunity to share the research that we're doing in the Gavdil Group at UC Berkeley. Well, so probably most of the people in the audience have heard of the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, which has exposed over 100,000 people to toxic levels of lead in their drinking water. However, what many people don't know is that lead leaching is actually quite a common problem. So it is estimated that there are about 5,000 US public drinking water systems currently in violation of the lead and copper rule, potentially putting at risk over 17 million people now, lead leaching is usually contained through the development of a natural scale within the pipes, which acts as a barrier that separates the metal and the water. However, this scale is very sensitive to water quality conditions, and changes in water quality may cause the scale to dissolve. And when this happens, we're in trouble because the existing solutions are not that great. So solution number one is pipe replacement, which you know solves the problem forever. However, this solution is very expensive, costing between $150 to $300 per meter of treated pipe. Um, yeah, it is estimated that in, only in Flint, Michigan, it will cost about $400 million to change the pipes, which, you know, considering that there are about 5,000 locations in the US that would need this, it is an unfeasible option. So option number two, is called uh, chemical conditioning of the water, which consists of adding small amounts of phosphates at the water treatment facility. The great thing about phosphates is that they're able to bind to dissolve lead in the water and form this uh, insoluble molecule called lead phosphate. So lead phosphates then precipitate and become part of the scale, strengthening it over time. This is a great option for maintaining an existing scale, but when this scale has dissolved, re-establishing via this method is very slow, taking between several months to many years, as we see in Flint, Michigan. In the Gadgil Group, we're developing a new technology meant to accelerate the formation of this insoluble scale. And we termed this technology ALPS, which is an acronym for Accelerated Lead Pipe Scale Buildup. And I'll show you how it works uh, with my slides. So imagine that we have a lead pipe, and imagine that, well, this lead pipe has no scale in it. Now imagine that we insert a wire within this pipe, and then we enrich the water with phosphates. We then connect the pipe and the wire to an external power source, and turn on the power to around one volt. What will happen here is that lead will start dissolving, like rapidly dissolving into the water, and it'll interact with the phosphates, forming lead phosphates, which will then precipitate and start forming a scale that will eventually cover the entire pipe. After the treatment, well, after the pipe has been covered in lead phosphates, we can then remove the power source, remove all the equipment, and the treatment is done. We, in our lab experiments, we were able to demonstrate that this treatment reduced, decreases lead leaching rates in about 99.9% .9 when compared to, you know, um, bare lead, which is why we want to pursue it further. We also had some help from the Haas Business School at UC Berkeley, who helped us uh, figure out the cost of this technology. And so taking into account the operating costs, because we need to pay a plumber to do all this, and also the cost of the license, which would need to be purchased from UC Berkeley, and also the cost of the phosphates and all the things needed for this. We estimate that the treatment will cost about $10 per meter of treated pipes, uh, which is at least 15 times uh, lower than pipe replacement. And therefore, we believe that this technology could feasibly provide lead-free water for, well, for everyone. And with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Uh, yeah, I'm Bob Service with Science. Sorry I'm late, but uh, thanks for doing this. Can you, I, um, 
I think from the press release, it was pretty clear on uh, that the in the normal scaling process, the phosphate ions interact with the lead ions to create the scale. Why is that process slow? And then can you just walk me through what happens when you add that electric current? Where are those electrons going, and mm -hmm. how does that speed it up? Sure. Well, normally it is slow because lead corrosion is like a very slow process. There is usually not a lot of lead dissolved in the water. It's just that lead is very toxic. So we worry about very like small concentrations. So given that lead is in, like in very small concentrations dissolved in the water, it'll interact with phosphates. It just will form a very, very small amount of lead phosphates at a time. Therefore, that's why it takes so long for it to form naturally. In the case of this process, what we're doing is, is yeah, we're oxidizing lead rapidly, and those electrons that, that come out of the lead ions from the pipe will go into the wire. That's why we have to insert a wire within the pipe. And the electrons will go to, um, well, they could go to, a, to multiple reactions. In this case, well, what we're, I was showing in the slides, that shows um, stainless steel wire. And if that's the case, then the reaction that we will have at the stainless steel wire is hydrogen evolution. So we will form small um, bubbles of hydrogen gas. Yeah, but that could change. We could also form like hydrogen peroxide. It depends on, on the material that we choose of the wire. So I guess I'm still not quite clear. So, um, sorry, I guess I'm still not quite clear. So the, the, the electrons, the electricity mm -hmm. goes into... Oh yeah, so the, the, so the electrical current goes from the, goes from the lead pipe into the wire. Okay. Yeah, so the electrons go from the lead pipe, which causes the release of lead ions into the water. Oh, so it just speeds up the release of lead. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, sorry I wasn't okay. clear no, about no, that. that's my, yeah. my own. Mm -hmm. uh, Bela Buslig, ACS. Um, there is a couple of things uh, things that it's kind of intriguing about this thing. What, one is, is uh, when you're uh, accelerating the, the deposition of, uh, of phosphate as a, as a scale, uh, how do you, or when do you decide to discontinue the electric mm. uh, current? Because obviously, the, uh, the logical, at least in my mind, would be uh, would be is monitoring the uh, the lead content and the phosphate content uh, coming out of the, uh, the pipe, and and just discontinue it when, whenever there's no lead, or at least virtually no lead, uh, and and the phosphate con contents. Uh, it returns back to uh, back to what you're feeding the uh, the pipe, which essentially requires a fairly large container of phosphate. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's uh, that's the one uh, one other uh, one thing. The other thing is these systems usually are kind of a, a, a mixed match kind of thing. It's not all lead pipe. Uh, you've got the, uh, uh, the, there are times when you cannot reach the uh, the pipe. Uh, directly to connect uh, your electrode to it, maybe on one end or, or another. Uh, so uh, how would you approach something which has, has, let's say, a steel pipe leading the water into the lead pipe and, and so forth, because there's electrolysis at, uh, at the junction? And uh, Well, th this is the first question anyway. Okay, yeah, those are great questions. So let me start with the first one. Um, so lead lead phosphates are not conductive. Therefore, if we do the treatment in a pipe, eventually the current that we observe will start decreasing as the pipe gets covered in lead phosphates. And when the pipe has been completely covered, the current will just drop to zero. And that's when we know that the treatment is done. So we don't, we don't set like a set time. We just do the treatment until the current is zero. And that basically guarantees that the pipe is no longer conductive, so there is no more metal exposed to the water. Uh, that's for the first question. And the second question is actually yeah, something that we have been asking ourselves, like what happens if there's like an iron juncture or, or a copper pipe mixed with the lead? And yeah, so our treatment will, will corrode all the pipes. We'll start, we, we'll have, for example, we have iron pipes and lead 
and lead pipes connected, we will have a lot of iron and lead going into the water and interacting with the phosphates. We are not sure what, what the galvanic effect will be. So galvanic effect is just when you have two different metals connected to each other. Um, this is something that we still need to measure in the lab, but all of these metal form corrosion products, which eventually passivate the scale, meaning that they cover it in an insoluble scale. So we're pretty confident that this treatment, if there's like, if there's, uh, if there are like two different metals, what will happen is that it'll form a scale on top of the two metals, just like with different corrosion products. Okay, now the lead phosphate scale is non-conductive, as you say, but it's still char it's a charged surface. Why not follow it up with with something like a, like a polymer or or uh, microarrays of polymers that essentially get an overcoat on, mm. uh, on it? So when they change the, the water source, like they did in Flint, uh, you essentially are protected for, uh, further, and. Uh, at the very end of, uh, uh, like close to, uh, to the, uh, the faucet, you still would be advised to put, uh, put an ion exchanger to make sure that, uh, that nothing reaches the, reaches the customer. Okay, so yeah, I see what you mean. So yeah, actually we, we have been consider, considering using some sort of either organic coating or a sink coating on top of our on, on top of our treatment, which would, you know, it, it would make the treatment better. Um, that's something that we're still exploring. However, we're like, we're, we're first determining the optimal conditions to form this initial layer of lead phosphate. Uh, using an organic, like an organic coating has its um, other challenges. Like they will, the organic coatings will react with free chlorine and they could make um, some pretty toxic substances if we're not careful about which substance we choose. So we're first targeting the problem of, okay, let's figure out how to make a scale consisting of lead phosphates, but then the next step would be, okay, how can we make the scale stronger? And regarding like putting a filter on the consumer side, that's definitely something that we would recommend always. Um, however, the whole point of this treatment is to provide like uh, an affordable technology so that everyone can access lead-free water. And these filters tend to be pretty expensive. So we would like our technology not to depend on these kinds of filters. And that's what we're aiming for. Thank you. Katie Cottingham, ACS. So do you need to run the wire through the whole pipe or can you just kind of do it at the ends and it'll just sort of propagate? No, you have to run the wire through the entire system and that's a huge challenge. We, we have spoke to multiple plumbers who said that it's, it's feasible, it, it can be done. And that's, 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 why the cost, that's why it costs $10 per meter of treated pipe. Like if it wasn't for the wire, this treatment would cost less than a dollar. Um, for the entire treatment, so because yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's a wire. It also should have like some spacers because we cannot have the wire touching the pipe. Because that would cause a short circuit in our system. Any other questions? I have a question. So have you tested this mostly in the lab now or have you been able to go out and try it like on actual pipes in the ground? Well, most of our work so far has been in the lab. Um, however, lately we have been using lead pipes that were taken from the, taken from the field. Mm -hmm. And we have applied the treatment to those pipes and it has, it has worked. And these pipes had like pre-existing scale. So it's more, um, it's more similar to what we would find in, in like the field, mm -hmm. right? So we're confident that this would work, although in the field there's a mul multiple of other challenges that we're probably not aware of now. Um, so yeah, that's the next step. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, over here. Um, so in uh, y y uh, your abstract mentions the fact that uh, the scaling can be somewhat porous and, uh, and that's something you guys need to look at. Can you describe that? And if it is porous, you're saying it's, it's non-conductive. So that suggests to me that lead is not getting out. And you said earlier on that lead isn't getting out. Mm -hmm. But if it's porous, why isn't it getting out? Well, sometimes the pores are like so small 
that even with the potential that we're supplying, lead cannot get out of like it, it's still protected by this barrier. But eventually, these pores can get like bigger, and lead leaching can occur through these pores. We're trying to change the characteristics of the of the water that we use to minimize the porosity, which I think we have been successful. Like varying, for example, the phosphate concentration or the pH that seems to control how porous our our scale is. All right, thank you. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore Orlando 2019. This has been our final news briefing from ACS's Spring 2019 National Meeting in Orlando. We hope that you have enjoyed these briefings and thank you for your attendance and participation.